Hey, what's up y'all? This is William, the Permaculture Consultant, and today we're going to be harvesting sweet potatoes out of the permaculture garden. Now, if you guys remember, or if you're new to the channel, this garden is its first year in production since being abandoned. You can see the two sweet potato beds right here. Here's one right here, and here's another one right here. And I have not, oh, some made a watermelon. Look at that. Something did some damage to a watermelon. Anyway, I still got one over here that's nice and protected. You can see that one. Uh, but anyway, I have not watered. One thing, to, one thing that's important to keep in mind is that I have not watered any of this stuff since basically it was put in earlier this year. Now, it's been about 90 days since uh, planting these guys, and there's a mixture of sweet potatoes in here. Some are the ones that I started. Some are the ones that I purchased. But uh, yeah. I started down here earlier yesterday just to see if we had any sweet potatoes, um, and we definitely do. I don't know how many, so uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. And it's important to say that I don't care if the rest of the garden produces food. As long as these sweet potatoes produce year after year after year, that's perfectly fine with me. That's the only thing I care about actually producing in this garden are sweet potatoes because sweet potatoes are the best alrighty so I got my buckets right here um, I did clear some of this stuff away just to see because I wanted to check the sweet potatoes before I just went ahead and started digging them uh, it does appear that they're as ready as they're going to be yeah keep in mind y'all I haven't watered this since basically putting these guys in I've just let the basically the cover crop which before these sweet potatoes was actually clover and then the sweet potato vines took over and acted as the cover crop and the only water that they've received is uh whatever fell from the sky basically so i got my handy dandy gloves on i got a bucket ready and now i'm gonna go ahead and start breaking this up and seeing what i can find got my potato fork right here Oh, there we go. Instead of just taking the vines off, one thing you can do is just trace the vines back into the, um, back to the ground and see where the potatoes are and stuff. Now these vines are gonna be used for a few different things. They're gonna be used for the pigs over there. We can also eat them um, as like greens, basically like same way you would cook spinach. And also it's going to go into future compost. So I'm just gonna put everything over to this side for right now, and then we'll sort all that stuff out later. All right, so on this end of the bed, I gotta be honest, it ain't looking too good. And this side also were the ones that I started myself, not the ones that I purchased. So let's move on down some more. They may have done better in certain beds than others, so hopefully not all is lost. Oh yeah, another big one. Okay, so the sweet potatoes seem to be a little hit or miss on this side. There'll be like a few big ones and then a whole bunch of small ones, and then a few big ones and a whole bunch of small ones. Which may be which could be a few different things. It could be that this soil was too compacted, which makes sense because this, remember, this is the first year it's producing since being abandoned and stuff. Um, another reason could be because I didn't wait long enough necessarily. I'm kind of taking the average of the sweet potatoes that were planted. That's a carrot. That right there is a little carrot. See that? Now I should say I am noticing big differences in this bed since, you know, first coming back here and reshaping these beds. Ooh, there's another carrot. Look at that. Huh? Now, if you don't know, the first thing I had in this bed were actually carrots. Um, apparently some of them worked out <laughs> so much later. 
But uh, as I was saying, I've noticed some big differences in this soil since the first time uh, planting in here. For example, these aggregates did not exist before. Um, aggregates are basically areas where the microbes are, they're breaking down the organic material and they're gluing everything together, which creates like these tiny little crumbs. That's where your crumb structure comes from. Y'all, apparently you can grow sweet potatoes and carrots, I should say baby carrots, with the same dog on time. Because I'm getting just about as many carrots as I am sweet potatoes over here. But and the only really amending that I've done to this soil is plant stuff, like a cover crop, um, you know, whatever. These carrots and potatoes, sweet potatoes, that's all I've done. And this soil has gotten way, way, way better. And I'm noticing like an uptick in uh, potatoes since getting closer towards the middle of this bed. Also, I do, one of the downsides though is that I do feel the compaction layer um, at the bottom of this bed. So I know exactly where these roots are being stopped basically. Due, the, due to the compaction. But one thing I'm surprised about is how many carrots I'm actually harvesting out of this sweet potato bed as well. And if you've never grown your own sweet potatoes before, I highly recommend it. It's better by far. This is one of those things that you can't buy from the store. I mean, granted, you can buy sweet potatoes from the store, but they don't taste anything like the ones, you know how like you make your, or you grow your own, uh, tomatoes and stuff and they don't taste like anything like at the store um, that's especially true when it comes to sweet potatoes in my opinion sweet potatoes 10 times better whenever you raise them at home or you grow them at home I came out here to harvest sweet potatoes turns out I'm harvesting sweet potatoes and carrots also I don't know if I said this already but it's easier to harvest these these vines, or not the vines, but the sweet potatoes themselves, if you leave the vines attached and then just follow the vines back uh, to the sweet potato, basically. You're less likely to get, I mean, because obviously the potatoes are attached to your uh, vines, so it's easier to follow and find all the potatoes if you follow the vines back. And you know one thing else is that I haven't come across a single, I've come across anthills, but I haven't come across a single anthill that is actually, um, that actually has any ants, which just further, I guess this is just further proof for my hypothesis that as you increase the soil biology, the uh, ants are replaced by the worms. Now I will also say, I haven't seen very many worms either. It could be because of how, it could just be further in the ground. Um, but I haven't seen many of those guys. Haven't seen any ants either though. So I wonder if it's in the middle of that transition. And I'm about to actually kind of screw it up by digging up all this stuff. Because if you dig, like every time you break up the soil, you're destroying kind of the soil structure. And when you destroy the soil structure, it settles and then it compacts again. So after I reshape this bed, after digging everything up, this will be a different video, but after reshaping this bed, I'm gonna go ahead and probably get it planted pretty quickly because plant roots are one of the ways you can avoid compaction after like a deep tilling and stuff, which is exactly what I did. Um, oh. That one, we'll go to the pigs because I stabbed through it. We'll get a separate bucket for the pigs. But like I was saying before, if you till up your ground, it's important to get roots in it pretty quickly. So that way you, that way you don't cause excess compaction, which is exactly what I did with this garden bed. Whenever I first tilled it up and shaped it, I seeded it with that clover cover crop. And that honestly, has had the biggest effect on turning this soil around than anything else I've done, is just planting a freaking cover crop. Man, these pigs are gonna love me today. They got a bunch of vines for them. Actually, they love me every day. They're pretty friendly pigs. 
But I got a bunch of vines for them. I got a bunch of sweet potatoes for them. Oh, yeah. Well, not a bunch of sweet potatoes, just the ones I stabbed through. Let me clarify on that one. <laughs> now, I will say also that this other bed seems to be doing better. That this bed over here to my right seems to be doing better than the bed I'm currently in. And uh, also keep in mind the bed I'm currently in are from the potatoes that I started myself. And the one next to me are the potatoes that I bought, basically. Alternatively, instead of tossing all the green material to the side, you could lay it down right behind you and then kind of mulch the bed as long as like as you go. Does that make sense? So as I'm pulling weeds or vines or anything like that, instead of tossing them over to the side, I can just toss them behind me and mulch behind me as I go which I'm not gonna do because it's just gonna make it harder for me to reshape this bed in a minute. But if you're not worried about reshaping the bed, then it's a pretty good way to go. Another thing is before those ants left, man, they made some awesome crumb structure in this soil. I know ants get a bad rap because they, they'll bite you, they'll sting you, they'll in some circumstances apparently kill you. And I gotta say, Australia and Texas have by far the most aggressive ants I've ever experienced in my life. Like, even those little black ants, like in, like the tiny little ones that you see around the house and stuff, the ones in Australia, whenever I was out there at Jeff Lawton's farm, those ones look at you, okay, so the ones in the United States, typically, the little black ants, they just kind of leave you alone and they're like, ah, whatever. The ones in Australia look at you and view you as like a freaking challenge, like, yeah. I'm going to take that big guy down and they'll just sting the crap out of you. They're so freaking aggressive over there. The ants, not the people. This is a very satisfying pull right here. Oh yeah. I'm going to go throw this. Ooh, look at that carrot. Look at that. That's the best carrot I've ever grown. <laughs> and I know that sounds I know that sounds sad to somebody called the permaculture consultant, but carrots have not been my friend in the past. Alrighty, as you can see, or maybe you can't see, but I am completely drenched. Uh, I'm gonna wring my shirt out after this and see how much sweat I actually lost. But I got two buckets right here. Those are for me. And then I got a bucket right here. That's for the pigs. And that all came out of this first row right here. Next up is this row. And this row is pretty, <coughs> excuse me. This row is pretty dense. This one I think is doing a lot better than that first row I just harvested. So, and also based on how dense and thick this stuff is, I think I'm gonna have to hack my way through this one grabbed a few new buckets for this bed because I want to see which bed actually performed better if it was the homegrown slips or the store-bought slips got to be careful around this tree right here this is part of my apple root stock that I'll use in the future this tree right here is sticking at the end of the bed with a rosemary plant now the rosemary plant I think died off but still got my apple tree and that's the m111 rootstock generally pretty good apple and probably the most common apple rootstock you can find oh i found an ant pile with ants on it okay so this is the first ant pile that i found and it's on the end of the bed i wonder if that's significant for any reason but this is the first ant pile i have found with ants still in there oh crap i stabbed through another sweet potato Oh, it's because there's a much larger ant mound right here. Yup, I'm getting lit up, dang. All right, I'm gonna have to work around that ant mound for now. Dang, that really sucks. Cause there are for sure some sweet potatoes underneath that mound right there. I'm gonna clear around it and then I'll work on that mound. So that way I can get in and out pretty quickly. 
Little they do they know is when an ant bites me, it dies. Too much pimping for it. <laughs> and if you're not familiar with my dad's channel, pimp stands for permaculture is my passion. I don't know if you guys can hear the piggies in the background, but they're wondering what I'm doing on over here and wondering if I have any snackies for them, which I do, just not yet. Just on initial analysis, this bed is doing far better. But also what I'm noticing is that this soil, just visually, seems to be better as well. Keep in mind, y'all, this garden was basically, I restored it from being abandoned, set everything in place, and then abandoned it again. I haven't watered this since like April or, yeah, about April. I can't remember exactly the last harvest water date, but... I remember it being, yeah, it was like April, I think, the last time I watered any of this. Like, literally any of this. The only time I've watered since then is if I planted something new, I would water it in, and then that would literally be it. That would be the only time, oh crap, I just grabbed a handful of ants. The only thing I can accredit it to, really, is that cover crop that I started with, is having that clover cover crop starting and then these guys eventually took over because there was never a time I'd come out here, especially in the mornings, <clears throat> where the soil was like bone dry. Especially if it was underneath that cover crop. It was never like saturated or anything, but it was never bone dry. And I didn't weed. I left all the weeds. So that might have something to do with it too. Like this is the first time I've ever weeded the sweet potato bed. Alrighty, so from this bed right here, which is the store-bought slips, I got two whole buckets and some pretty big tomato, or not tomatoes, but sweet potatoes. In this bed with the, um, the slips that I started myself, I got two and let's say three quarter buckets plus a whole lot of carrots. Now, the sweet potatoes that are going to the pigs is this bucket right here, which is about, hmm, maybe a sixth full now we're going to take these buckets back to the house and get them ready for curing all righty so now that i have my sweet potatoes back i'm now going to they're outside i set up these tables outside and i'm going to lay them down in a single file layer um especially in the summer this is especially helpful but i'm gonna lay them down in a single file layer and let them cure for basically five to seven days. Technically, I think it needs to be like five to seven days over 85 degrees. The only time it's not above 85 degrees around here is sometimes in the very, very early morning right before the sun comes out, but that's not very common. So yeah, oh, just dropped one. But yeah, this is how you cure your sweet potatoes. Uh, you also don't want them in direct sun and also do not clean them off before curing them. Uh, if you clean them off, I think it messes with the shelf life. So make sure you don't do that. And also guys, remember this was grown without watering like, I mean, this was watered in basically. And then that was it. Uh, cause whenever I planted these was about the time when I stopped watering the gardens and just, you know, let it see, let's see what was going to happen. Um, this is all due to, and I've got two more buckets over here. This is all due to, I think just the cover crop, which is pretty incredible. It makes you wonder how many plants we overwater just because we don't have a healthy ecosystem in our soil. So there's that. Alrighty, here they all are. Took up two folding tables, two whole folding tables, and this all required almost no water after after April. So hopefully this video was helpful for you guys. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching, and until next time, we'll see you.